we don't see points on the map. They aren't just places to us. We see stories of lives living without the hope found in Jesus. Today, somewhere between the Great Commission and the Great Multitude, we find ourselves facing the world's greatest problem, lostness. Even in the midst of natural disasters, humanitarian crises, and political instability, Southern Baptists send IMB missionaries to give their lives to the lost, living amongst those who have never heard the gospel. People in hard to reach places, people in cities, and those who are dispersed and displaced around the world. At the IMB, we believe that missionary presence cultivates gospel access. Gospel access that knows no geographic or social boundary. We believe that missionary presence fuels gospel belief, and we see the results. We see lives transformed, generations forever changed, and churches planted. Local expressions of the church that take ownership and thrive. God has made our purpose clear. Together, we seek to take the gospel to every nation, to all tribes, to all peoples, to all languages. We don't see places on a map. We see our place in fulfilling the Great Commission. This is our mission. This is your mission. And we are reaching the nations together. Good morning, Fairview family. It's good, it's good to see everybody here this morning on this beautiful Sunday morning. I'm thankful to be in God's house. I'm thankful to see each and every one of you guys here this morning. If you're visiting with us, I want you to know we're especially glad that you just worship with us this morning. We want you to feel at home. We want you to worship God. And we pray that you get something out of this message. Um, I've got a message here from our WOM director, who is also my awesome wife, Kathy. Um, this week is the week of prayer for Alabama's WMU Lottie Moon offering. There are prayer guides uh, for the week in the bulletin, and offering envelopes are in the pew or the tables in the connection corner. Uh, we'll be gathering donations to Lottie Moon until Christmas, and uh, we do have a goal this year of $8,500, which is increased over our previous goals. Um, also, the first evening Women on a Missions meeting is this Thursday, December the 8th at 6.30 in the Fellowship Hall. It's going to be a uh, Christmas ornament exchange, so please bring one of those and bring finger foods to share. All ladies of the church are invited, and if you have any questions, you can ask Kathy. She's sitting right up here. She'll raise her hand if you don't know who she is. Uh, just let her know if you have any questions about that. Uh, there's a lot going on at the church, so just take a look in your bulletin. A lot of good announcements there. Um, if you don't mind, I'm going to pray for us. Then after I pray, kids, if you want to come down front, meet Brother Glenn here. He's going to spend a little time with you. Let's pray. Father God, I am so thankful to be in your house this morning to worship you and study your word, God. I ask you to just help us focus solely on you this morning, God. Let us hear what you have to say to us this morning through your word and through the message that we're going to receive. God, I ask you to just be with everyone involved in the service this morning, God, and let everything we do be solely to glorify and honor you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen, kids. Y'all come on down here and join me down front and help me with some of these ornaments. I can only go this far because this is as long as court. That's okay, Carter. That's my. That was my planning. Let me find a seat here. All right, y'all going to be my helpers today? Okay. So, what is our new faith family verse? Y'all have been learning this. If you've been uh, on Wednesday nights, y'all been talking about this. It's part of the play that y'all are going to be putting on for us tomorrow. But our faith family verse says, "Every good." and perfect gift is from above coming down from the father of lights who does not change what do you mean tomorrow i said tomorrow next sunday it's coming quick though anyway <laughs> i can get away with nothing up here by the way 
nothing. Anyway, that's y'all's faith fam- our faith family verse for the month. But here's the best gift that I want us to talk about today. We have been given the gift of God's Word. We talked about it last month. We talked about it again. One of the best things we have from God, we've got His Son, Jesus, and we have the Bible. It's a wonderful gift. And in the Bible, there are all kinds of wonderful stories that tell us about who God is and His Son, Jesus, and how much He loves us. And so on this tree to my left, we've got ornaments telling about all of those stories. But I left a few of them down because I want you to help me put them on the tree and tell me about that story. So I'm going to pick up one of these ornaments right now. What do y'all see on that ornament? What does that look like? That's the earth. Who created the earth? God did. It's, we have that story in Genesis right at the very beginning of the Bible. It tells us about how God created this world for us to live in. And so we're so thankful for that. So would you help me put that ornament on the tree, please? Thank you very much. And what do we have here on this ornament? What do you see there? <laughs> the Ten Commandments. <laughs> Those are the Ten Commandments, right? Those are the, those are the tablets of the Ten Commandments. And so who gave us the Ten Commandments? God did. And so in the Bible, we've got the story of the Ten Commandments, the law that God gave us. Leland, will you help me and put those on the tree for me? Thank you, sir. And then what do we have on this ornament? The whale. Y'all remember learning about the big fish? From who? I think it was Jonah. 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 But that's, I think it was, I may be wrong. I, I don't doubt that I may be wrong. But Joan and the big whale. But that's another one of the wonderful stories that have how God wants to rescue his people that he put on this earth. And he gave the law to us. And we keep breaking those commandments. But God still wants to rescue us. So we have the story of Jonah. Brinkley, will you put that up there for me? And then what did he do to rescue us? What did he give us here? Who's that? Who's that? That's baby Jesus and baby Jesus. We're going to be celebrating Jesus' birth in just a couple weeks. But to rescue us, God gave us Jesus. Will you put that up there, Brad? Thank you very much. And then last ornament I want you to look at. What do you see on here? A crown. Who who wears a crown? The king wears a crown. And who is the king that we love? Jesus is our king. And Pastor Peter, when he preaches in a few minutes, he's going to talk to us about the king as well. So we get to celebrate the king who is Jesus. So all of those are stories right out of the Bible. Would you like to put that one up? I'll, okay, y'all go, y'all go work together while I finish talking. All right, thank you for your help. But we, have to, we get to celebrate all the stories of the Bible because God gave us that gift to celebrate him. Aren't y'all thankful for that? All right. Well, let's finish up by thanking the Lord for the gift of his Bible, and then we'll go back to our seats. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for these children. Lord, thank you that they are learning about the truth of your word and how much of a gift it is. Every time they go to Sunday school and to WHAM, thank you for the teachers who are teaching them about your word. And Lord, I pray during this season you would help us to be reminded about how every part of your word points us to the love of Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Y'all go back to your seats. And so, church, I also want to tell you that in just a few minutes, it won't be me preaching this morning. Uh, my son-in-law, Peter, will be preaching this morning. So uh, he'll be coming up as after the uh, praise team finishes. But I just want you to know this about him. I'm proud of him. I'm grateful for him. He is a true example of what the fruits of the Spirit are. And uh, I prayed and prayed, and Amy prayed and prayed for a, a son-in-law to marry Meredith that would exhibit the fruits of the Spirit, and we got all of them. We just didn't get a boy from the South. But that's okay. We love you, Peter, and thank you for preaching for us today. Well, good morning, church family. If you'll stand with us. Uh, As we enter this Christmas season, I know we're thinking about the birth of Jesus, but I wanted to remind you of why why he came, and that that stems from one of the the verses that our kids learn when they're very young, and it's John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. 
join with us as we sing God So Loved. today we pulled out an, an old hymn that our quartet normally sings but I know that a lot of you sing with us when when the quartet sings it beautiful star of Bethlehem
favorites away in a manger. Jesus lay down here. 
praise team heads down. I've asked Heather to sing a, a, a beautiful song called Breath of Heaven. And we were discussing, it's one thing, we've loved this, both loved this song since we were teenagers, but when you become a mama, this song is just so much more meaningful. So I'm sorry. <laughs> Oh. 
Well, good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing this morning? Good. A couple people are good. Uh, my name is Peter, uh, Peter McNamee, and I am uh, so thankful to be here with you this morning, so thankful to be able to open up the Word with you today. Uh, a little bit about me and my wife. Uh, we currently live in Colorado Springs, Colorado, and uh, we are very glad to be here because we're very much enjoying the warmer weather that's here. When we left and flew out, there was snow on the ground everywhere, and the temperature was in the teens. And so it was definitely beginning to look a lot like Christmas out there. But we are thankful to be here. Uh, we're actually in the midst of a transition. We are moving down at the beginning of the year to help pastor a church in Austin, Texas. And so uh, please keep us in your prayers for that. We would love that. Uh, we're very excited for this new season. But speaking of this season, uh, I'm so excited to be able to open up the Word with you during the month of December uh, because I don't know about you, but I love the Christmas season. I love everything about the Christmas season. I love the songs that you hear over and over and over again all the way up until Christmas Day. I love the decorations. You can see the trees in people's houses, the lights that are on outside. Uh, I love the food. I love the traditions. I love everything about Christmas. And even coming in here today and seeing this behind me, I, I don't know who did this in this church, but this is incredible back here, this setup, especially this north, this star up here, this is a work of art. The Star of Bethlehem, this is a work of art. So whoever did that, that's awesome. Uh, so thankful to be here, and I love Christmas, and there's so many reasons to love Christmas, And but it was mentioned this morning as we were beginning to worship, it's good for us to remember the true meaning of Christmas, and seeing as we are so close to the Christmas season, I wanted to take some time this morning to remind us of the goodness of of Christmas, and I wanted to remind us of the sweet fulfillment that Jesus was when he came. And another word for the Christmas season is the Advent season, and Advent means the arrival of someone or something expected. And so when we celebrate Advent, we are celebrating the coming of Jesus, the expectation that Jesus has come into the world. And so today, we're not going to look at the Christmas story specifically. We're not going to look at the manger. We're not going to look at the shepherds or the stable. We're not going to look at the wise men. But we're actually going to go way back, and we're going to talk about uh, a passage of Scripture that takes place 1,000 years before the birth of Jesus. And so if you have a copy of God's Word, I would encourage you to turn to Deuteronomy chapter 17. And what I want to look at today is I want to look at a very specific law and commandment that God gives the people of Israel. And I want to study how it prepares our hearts for the Advent season, how it prepares our hearts for the wonder and joy of who Jesus is. And so in Deuteronomy chapter 17, uh, I'm going to start in verse 14, and I'm going to read through the end and then I'll pray for us, and then we will get into it this morning. Deuteronomy seventeen fourteen. When you come to the land that the Lord your God is giving you, and you possess it and dwell in it, and then say, I will set a king over me, like all the nations that are around me, you may indeed set a king over you, whom the Lord your God will choose. One from among your brothers you shall set as king over you. And you may not put a foreigner over you who is not your brother, only he must not acquire many horses for himself or cause the people to return to Egypt in order to acquire many horses, since the Lord has said to you, you shall never return that way again. And he shall not acquire many wives for himself, lest his heart turn away, and nor shall he acquire for himself excessive silver and gold. And when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, he shall write for himself in a book a copy of this law approved by the Levitical priests. And it shall be with him, and he shall read it all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God by keeping all the words of this law and these statutes and doing them, that his heart may not be lifted up above his brothers, and that he may not turn aside from the commandment, either to the right hand or to the left, so that he may continue long in his kingdom, he and his children, in Israel. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for the opportunity that we have to gather here together as your church. Thank you for the joy it is to open up your word together. I thank you that your word uh, equips us for every good work, that your word is profitable for teaching, for correction, for reproof, 
Thank you that your word encourages our hearts. Thank you that your word challenges us, that it convicts us. But God, most of all, I'm thankful that your word leads us to your heart, that we can know you in a deeper way through your word. And I pray that that would happen here this morning as we study. We commit all these things to you in your name. Amen. Amen. So seeing as we're hopping into a pretty random passage in the Bible here, right smack in the middle of Deuteronomy. I think some context would be helpful for us in understanding what exactly is going on here. And so the book of Deuteronomy is written by Moses, and it is spoken to the nation of Israel as they are preparing to enter into the promised land that God has given them after 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. And so the people of Israel are camped on one side of the Jordan River, and they're getting ready to enter into the land that God has promised to them, that they have been waiting for, that they have been expecting. And so God, through Moses, begins to communicate his law to the next generation of believers who are going to take the land. God is communicating through Moses what the expectations are for the Israelites in accordance to living in obedience once they get into the promised land. These laws, these principles in Deuteronomy are to be what guides and equips the people as they go and enter into this new land. And this is the same law that God would command Joshua to not allow to depart from his mouth, but that he should meditate on it day and night so that he'd be careful to do according to all that is written in it. And then that his way would be prosperous, and then he would have good success. And so when we think about Deuteronomy, it's important to remember that these laws that God lays out, these are for the people of Israel's benefit. This is to help them walk in obedience to God. And so the word Deuteronomy in Hebrew means these are the words. These are the words. These are important. Pay attention to them. And then the Greek word for Deuteronomy means second law. It's not a different law, but it is a copy of the law that God had already given to the people of Israel. And so in the midst of all of this instruction, we come to the passage today that we're looking at in Deuteronomy chapter 17. And in this passage, God is laying out laws and requirements for a future king of Israel. God is laying out an expectation for the king. What does the ideal king look like? When somebody comes to lead in Israel, what will the ideal king look like? How should the ideal king act? And what should the ideal king prioritize? What would an ideal king look like for the nation of Israel? Now, up to this point in the Bible, Israel has not had a king yet. And in fact, Israel's not going to have a king for over a hundred years after this passage is written. But one day in the future... Israel will have a king. Israel will have multiple kings. And it will not come about in the ideal way, as we're going to talk about here in a second. Israel will desire to be like every other nation who's in the world, and they say, we want a king to rule over us. But they will get a king. And so God, in his foreknowledge in this passage, God is preparing them for the day when they will have a king who is ruling over them. And I love this because don't you just love the sovereignty of God? Don't you love the sovereignty of God? Even in this moment here, when God is preparing the people of Israel, he is preparing them to have a king. And the people who are listening to Moses give this talk, the people who are listening to Moses equip them, give them the law, none of these people are going to be alive when Israel actually gets their first king. Right? But God, in his faithfulness, is already preparing the way, is already setting the expectation for Israel so they know how to walk. And even though Israel is going to ask for a king from not the best motives, uh, God is already laying an expectation. He's already laying a foundation here so the people know what to expect, and they know how to find the heart of God in that. And I love this because none of these people at the time are going to be alive for when that king is appointed, but that doesn't matter because God's plan, God's word, and God's purpose are perfect, and they live on from generation to generation. Amen? And so I love this. As they're getting ready to enter into the land, this is happening. And so as God is communicating through Moses, God lays out these laws and these expectations for future kings. And I want to look at three aspects of this today with you. And I wanna, we'll talk about this a little bit, and then I want to talk a little bit about how this played out for Israel 
in their history, and then I want to talk about the coming king in Jesus. And so these verses are going to identify the king's qualifications. It's going to identify the king's conduct, and it's going to identify the king's training. And so let's start with qualifications. This is going to answer the question, who must the king be? Who must the perfect ideal king be? And if we look at this passage, first, the king must be chosen by God. This is the first requirement. The king must be chosen by God. God is the one who will appoint this king. God is the one who will set this king in place. This king will rule because God has prepared for that king to rule. God will establish the work of the king's hands. And elsewhere from Scripture, we know that this is to be the case, for we know that God is the one who ultimately puts people in positions of authority, and God is the one who removes people from positions of authority. And so God will be the one who will choose this king. But also, this king must be from within the nation of Israel. This king must come from Israel. The law states that the king must be one from among your brothers. He must be somebody from within the nation. He must not be from outside of the nation of Israel. Why is this important? Why is this significant? Coming from Israel would mean that the king would be familiar with the law of God. The king would be familiar with who God is. He'd be familiar with what it means to follow after God. He'd be well-versed in God's commands to his people, and he'd be able to rightly lead his people to the heart of God and in obedience to God. And if we're not careful when we first look at this passage, we could say, well, this feels, this feels construed. This feels tight-gripped. Why, why couldn't the king come from somewhere else? Why couldn't the king come from somewhere outside of Israel and come in and influence the people? But to see the true heart of this, we need to understand the true heart of God. God's plan for the king to come from Israel was so that the nation of Israel would be led rightly in the commands of God, and then the nation of Israel would be a blessing to the rest of the world as a result of that. But another reason that the king must come from within the nation is that if the king came from outside of Israel, there was a risk that there could be some idolatry that that could come in. There could be some false worship. There could be other gods that would make an appearance, different influences. And as we'll see here in a second, some of the other kings in Israel were victim to this. They brought in teaching other than the true word of God. And this is also important because this means that the king of Israel, the true king of Israel, is not going to be somebody who conquers Israel. There's going to be other people, other nations in the Old Testament who will come and who will conquer Israel. And they will try to rule over them. But the king, the true king of Israel, is not going to be someone who takes the throne by force, but it's going to be somebody who is worthy of that throne. It's going to be somebody who's worthy of it. And so that's our qualifications. This is who the king must be. This is where he must come from. Now let's talk about the king's conduct. How how must the king act? How must the king act? And we come to a, a very interesting verse, and it says, The king must not acquire many horses for himself. Must not acquire many horses for himself. Now, this may seem a little bizarre to us or a little strange to us living in the 21st century where horses are viewed more as a luxury than a necessity. Uh, But in the ancient world, horses were invaluable. Okay, horses were invaluable. They had so much worth. They had so much purpose. Not only were they the fastest mode of travel, they were the original motor car back then, But having a lot of horses was also a sign of strong military might. If you had a lot of horses, you had a lot of power, okay? And this makes sense when you think about fighting or when you think about hand-to-hand combat. If you were in a fight with somebody and you had a sword and they had a sword or a spear over here, you know, it'd be a pretty evenly matched fight. But if you were in a fight with somebody and you had a sword and somebody was coming at you on a horse with a sword— clearly they would have the advantage, right? They're running straight at you. And so there is a lot of power in the amount of horses. And the Bible talks about and explains that the more horses that you have, it leads to more power, okay? Your enemies would be cautious to pick a fight with you if you had a large army of chariots and 
horses. And so why is it important that this king not acquire many horses? Why would it be important that this king not have all these horses, not seek to have all of this power? We might think, hey, that would actually make a pretty good king if they had a pretty well-established army of horses, right? If they had a lot of military might, this feels like they would be a good king. And this is because the heart of the king was not meant to trust in horses or military might, but the heart of the king was to trust in the strength of God. The heart of the king was to trust in the strength of God. And so the expectation for the king is that you should not put your ultimate faith in military power or in military might to protect you, to keep you safe. And even in, in 2 Samuel, we're jumping ahead here a little bit, but in 2 Samuel, David's son Absalom, who was a rough kid in some regards. Uh, David's son Absalom begins to work up this conspiracy against his father, and he's going to try and come and claim the throne of Israel. And we are told in 2 Samuel that Absalom acquired a chariot and horses. And as you read that, you think, why is this random detail in the Bible here that Absalom acquired these things? And the Bible is showing us that Absalom was gaining power. Right, that he was gaining resources, that he was going to be able to make a push for his father's throne, that he was gaining power. Think of this, uh, Psalm chapter 20, verse 7, says this, Some trust in chariots, and some trust in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. Let me read that again. Some trust in chariots, and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God our God. And when we understand the importance of horses and chariots, we understand the heart of this verse and what the psalmist is writing. The psalmist is reminding his heart that his trust was ultimately in God and not in horses or human strength. His trust is in God. And this was a natural reality to put your trust in if you lived in the ancient world. Right? This was natural. You, you could see the horses. You could see the chariots. You're putting your trust in something seen and tangible that you think will sustain you. And so it's easy to understand why this verse is so significant. And so the king must not put his trust, he must not put his faith in many horses or in the might of man. And I think here's a good moment for us to pause this morning. Um, This is a good moment for us to just take a step away from Deuteronomy for a second because I think passages like this really show the tendency of our hearts sometimes, right? We might not be tempted to put our faith in horses or chariots. If you have a lot of chariots, you know, more power to you. That's awesome. Uh, But we might not be willing to put, you know, prone to put your faith in chariots or horses, but we are all prone to put our faith in something other than God at certain seasons of our life. We are all prone to put our trust, to put our security, to put our faith in something other than God. And that might look different for every single person in here. That might look different for, from you, from other people in your family, or some of your friends. But all of us are tempted to believe the lie that there are other things in this world that will sustain us and provide for us more than God will. Here's just a few examples of them. Maybe some of us in this room are tempted to find our security in finances, in money, all right? We, we accumulate more money. We want to build up money. We want to make sure our savings is, is nice and full. And we tell ourselves that the more that we save, the more that we collect, the safer we're going to feel. The more confident we're going to feel, the more comfortable we're going to feel. But no amount of money ever makes us feel truly safe, and so we're always seeking more and more and more, and we're always pursuing after it. Maybe for some of, this, some of us in this room, we're tempted to find safety and security in our own image or our personality or what other people perceive us as. And so we put on this display, we put on this persona, and so that we believe that people will give us more respect, they'll give us more admiration when we have those things, then we'll finally feel confident. Then we'll finally feel secure in who we are and where we are in life, but no amount of praise from other people will ever fill us. And so we keep seeking it, and we keep seeking it, we keep trying to accumulate it. Maybe for others in this room, it's accomplishments. It's accomplishing different things. It's getting that next promotion at work. You know, working your way up the ladder and getting that next promotion. It's getting that next ideal job that you really want. 
man, once I get this job, that's, then I'll be there. Once I, once I move into that corner office, you know, I'll be, I'll be all set. I'll be ready to go. Maybe it's an accomplishment on uh, a sports team. Maybe it's honors or recognition in school. Whatever it is, we have this idea that if we get recognized by other people, if we live in these accomplishments, that we will find safety and security. In church, I think we would be wise this morning to remember the warnings of the word and why these commands had to be given in the first place. Every human heart is prone to wander. Every p- human heart is prone to put faith in something other than God. But it's good for us to remember that we trust in the name of the Lord our God. He is the one who is our strength, and he is the one who is our safety and security. Amen? Amen. Oh, I love it. I love this. This is so fun. I'm having such a great time being here. Uh, also, B- Brother Glenn didn't give me a time limit for how long to preach, so I'm going to try to get us all out of here by 2 p.m. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, So let's keep going. Uh, So the king must not acquire many horses for himself, but what must the king also do? It says the king must not acquire many wives for himself. The king must not acquire many wives for himself. Kings in the ancient world oftentimes would marry out of a desire for political alliance. They'd marry out of a desire for political alliance. And so when we think about marriage, a lot of times in the 21st century, we think about marriage as love-based, right? You can find somebody that you love, you commit to that person, you want to spend the rest of your life with that person. But this was not always the case in the ancient world. Oftentimes, marriages were seen as a means to an end. They had a motive behind them. And so if I'm leading this nation over here, and this nation over here is an enemy, if I can marry somebody from this nation, then that will put me on good terms with them. Now, I don't have to worry about them. They're not going to attack somebody who they dearly love, and so I'm safe. And so oftentimes there was a motive behind these different marriages. And so the king was not to take many wives, because if the king was truly following the Lord, the king would not need political alliances. Okay? If the king was truly trusting the Lord, he was truly following the Lord, the king would not need political alliances. And now, when we first hear this, we'd say, well, did God want Israel to just be a lone ranger out there and not have any friends, just an enemy of every nation? I don't think that is at the heart here. Because I think Israel, again, was meant to be a blessing to other nations. But what this is talking about here is that the nation of Israel or the the king of Israel would not be dependent on other nations for security. Okay, At the end of the day, the nation of Israel would have their faith and trust in God alone. Are you guys with me? And so the, the hope for this king is that they would not use many wives to get to a place of political alliance with other nations, but their hope and their trust would ultimately be in God and in God's provision. Now, there's also a temptation, and we've mentioned this a little bit already. There's a temptation that if you married somebody from outside of the nation of Israel, there was a risk of bringing false idols into your kingdom. There will be a risk risk of bringing other religions or other gods into your kingdom. And we actually see this in Scripture. In 1 Kings chapter 3, we learn that King Solomon uh, married, uh, entered into a marriage alliance with Pharaoh and Egypt. And we'll talk more about what happens with Solomon coming up, but needless to say, it didn't end super well. Uh, So the king is once again commanded in this passage to trust in the Lord and not trust in the things or the people of this world. Okay? So the king must not acquire many horses. The king must not acquire many lives. And final lives, wives. <laughs> and then finally, the king must not acquire large amounts of gold and silver. The king must not acquire large amounts of gold and silver. And this one can make uh, sense to a lot of us on the surface. The king is not to place his faith in wealth and money, but in the Lord. The king's not to trust in the amount of resources and money that he acquires, but his ultimate hope and faith is to be in God. Not acquiring large amounts of silver and gold would keep the king from developing a sinful sense of independence where he has no need to trust in anybody else. A false sense of security that they, he is in complete control. But there is more to money than just riches. There's more to money than just having a lot of wealth. Whoever had the money had the power, 
right? Whoever had the money had the power. They could control the economy. They could control the taxes. They could control trading. And so the king must not only be somebody who acquires great wealth for himself, but the king must also not be somebody who seeks to acquire great power for himself. The king must be humble before God. The king must be humble. And so notice the trend here for a second. Notice the trend of what's happening here in Deuteronomy. With silver and gold, the king was tempted to trust in his own riches and power. The king was tempted to trust in his own abilities, his own resources, his own control that he would have. With the horses, with not acquiring horses, the king was tempted to trust in the might of his kingdom or his empire that he was leading. And then with the wives, the king was tempted to trust in the might of other nations. And so look at what God's doing here in this passage. He says, God wants the king to be somebody who is not tempted to trust in any individual human, any human empire, or or any other nation in the world. The king is to be somebody who trusts solely in the strength and might of God. And it's wonderful. And so here's what God's saying. He's saying a tr- to the king, don't trust yourself. Don't trust those around you. Don't trust in the nations to deliver you, but rather trust in me because I'm the only one worthy of it. I'm the only one who can deliver you. I'm the only one who can sustain you. I'm the only one who can help you lead your kingdom in prosperity. And so finally, we'll make the transition. We'll talk about the training of the king. Talk about the training of the king. How must the king be prepared? How must, how must the king be prepared? Here's what it says. It says, the king is to be rooted in the law of God. The king is to be rooted in the law of God. In verse 18, when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, he shall write for himself in a book a copy of this law approved by the Levitical priests. I love this. The king is meant to find meaning, direction, and purpose from the word of God. It is to be his compass. It is to be his anchor. And the knowledge that he would gain from the law of God would help him to make wise decisions and help lead his nation with integrity and humility. All these other things that God is asking of this king, not to acquire horses, not to acquire gold and silver, not to acquire many wives, none of that would be possible without the king abiding in and living the law of God living the word of God. And so this was a non-negotiable for God. This was a deal breaker, right? (laughs) This is something that the king has to do. If there's one thing that we got to make sure we're on the same page about, it is that the king is somebody who knows the word of God and who lives the word of God because knowledge of the word and trust in the word and living the word always leads us into deeper relationship with the one true God. And so what's required of the king in this passage is actually so much more than simply knowing the word. It's so much more than simply knowing the right answers. It says that this king is to memorize the word. This king is to meditate on the word. It's always to be with him, no matter where he goes. If he's going outside, he's got a copy of it. If he's going inside, he's got a copy of it. If he's going to sleep, he's got a copy of it there. There shouldn't be a moment in the life of the king that he has to face without the word of God with him. He must live in the word, and he must allow the word to live through him. Amen? And and so that's it. That's the requirements. Pretty simple, right? (laughs) Pretty pretty simple. But what happens? You know, God God lays out these expectations for a king. The king is getting ready to come in a couple, in over a hundred years. And so how does it turn out for Israel? So here's what I want to do for the second half of us today. I want to do a quick flyover of the Old Testament. I want to talk about how Israel lived out these commands, and then I want to talk about how they were ultimately fulfilled in the one true king, as Glenn mentioned earlier. So here we go. The first king that Israel gets is a guy named Saul. Uh, Saul is not a good king. Saul has moments, he's got flashes of goodness, and you read it, and you're like, oh, Saul, you're a pretty good guy. But then there's other moments you just like, oh, this isn't isn't great, Saul. Uh, Saul's not a great king, and the reason that Saul's not a great king is because Saul values the opinions of his people more than he values the opinion of God. And so a lot of his decisions that he makes when he's king will be motivated by a desire to be right in the people's eyes and not be right in the Lord's eyes. And this mostly comes because he feels threatened by David. 
He was threatened by David, who will become king after him. So the first king of Israel, not great. But then comes David. David becomes king after Saul. And David is the greatest king that Israel will have in the Old Testament. David will do many wonderful things for the nation of Israel. David will be called a man after God's own heart. He will lead the people of Israel, and he will lead them well. But David is not a perfect king. And if we're familiar with any of David's story, we know that David was an adulterer. We know that David was a murderer. We know that David took multiple wives for himself. And after David is king, we come to Solomon. Now, I th- before we get to Solomon, I think it, it's interesting to note that even with King David, who is the greatest king that Israel will have in the Old Testament, even the greatest king that Israel had was still not a perfect king, right? Even the very best that we read about, and so much of the Old Testament is centered around David's story, or it's written by David, and so much of that is, is such wonderful things, but even the greatest king was still not a perfect king, right? There was something deeper that was needed. And so after David, it comes his son. And don't worry, I'm not going through every single king in the Old Testament here. We're, gonna, we're going high level. I see some looks out there. People are like, he's going to go through every single king. But fear not. <laughs> we're not. Uh, so then we come to Solomon. David has his son, Solomon. And Solomon starts out real great because Solomon has this moment with God where he can ask anything of God, and God gives Solomon wisdom, and Solomon leads very wisely. And people come from all over to gain the wisdom of Solomon, to allow Solomon to lead them. But Solomon's ultimately undone as king because he's undone by many marriages that he has with many alliances that he makes with other nations, and slowly and surely false teaching and idolatry and false gods creep into the nation of Israel and begin to rot it out from the inside out. And even Solomon, in all of his wisdom, the wisest person that we read about in Scripture until we get to Jesus, even Solomon does not heed the laws from Deuteronomy, and even the wisest person is not the perfect king. And then during the reign of Solomon's son, as this false teaching, as this wickedness has crept into Israel and it's begun to decay from the inside out, during Solomon's son's reign, his name's Rehoboam, the nation of Israel cracks and it splits in half. And all of a sudden you have the northern kingdom of Israel and you have the southern kingdom of Judah. And so even now we see the effects of an imperfect king happening. We see the effects of it. And so let me summarize the rest of it. We'll we'll skip all the rest of the kings, most of them. Let me summarize the rest of this for you. Once it splits, the nation of Israel, the northern nation, they'll have 19 more kings, 19 of them, before they will be conquered. And of those 19, every single one of them will be remembered for their wickedness in Scripture. All 19 of them. All of them will, of something of the sort will be said of them that they did something wicked in God's eyes that they did something that led to idolatry, that they led, they let false teaching, they pursued after other gods, they put their trust in other things, all 19 of them. And then you have the nation of Judah, the, the southern nation. Judah will have 20 kings before it's all said and done. And of those 20 kings, the majority of them will be bad kings. But there are a few that are, are remembered well in Scripture. There are a few that are remembered for the good things that they do. King Asa was a good king. Scripture remembers him well, but it says that even King Asa inflicted cruelties upon the people, and he put his trust in the wisdom of man other than the wisdom of God. Jehoshaphat was a good king. He was a king of Judah. He was a good king, but he also made an alliance with other nations that were wicked. He went into alliance with other nations, and he went to them for help instead of going to God. And we can see when we look back at Deuteronomy 17 why that would be a problem. Right? We can understand the heart of God here. And then King Uzziah was a good king. He's remembered well. But King Uzziah was struck with leprosy because King Uzziah tried to burn incense. He tried to take on a priestly duty and take matters into his own hands, and he tried to trust in his own power. And so he, these were all good kings, but once again, they were imperfect kings. And I think Scripture does a good job of reminding us that they were imperfect because the story of Scripture is ultimately pointing us to a place where there is a deep desire, there is a deep hunger for a perfect king to come. That there is a perfect king to come. The standards that were set in Deuteronomy 
seemed unreachable and unattainable for any king. But there was a great king coming who would fulfill all of these laws and more. There was somebody coming. There was a king who was coming who would be the perfect king for Israel. They would be the perfect king. They would meet all of these requirements. And I think this section of Deuteronomy is so good because the requirements for a king remind us that on our own, none of us will ever truly measure up to God. Right? Just as scripture says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And God has laid on him the iniquities of us all. All of us are prone to wander. All of us fall short of the glory of God. Even the very best of us are nowhere near the righteousness of God. Nowhere near it. And these verses remind us that there is a deep need in all of us for something and somebody greater to come and help us. And church, this is the wonder of Christmas. This is, we, we, we got here. We got to, <laughs> we finally got to baby Jesus, King Jesus. And this is the wonder of Christmas. This is the joy that we celebrate during the Advent season. We celebrate the arrival of Jesus, who is the true king. We celebrate the arrival of Jesus, who is king of kings, who is lord of lords, and of whose reign there will be no end, that he is perfect, he is the complete king, and that he is leading us. And Jesus is greater than the other king. Jesus is worthy of all praise. And so what I want to do is this. I want to take a minute and talk about this king. I want to talk about the goodness of this king, the goodness of Jesus, that we can celebrate that together, and then we'll, we'll close down, okay? So here we go. Here's reasons that Jesus is the ultimate king. First, Jesus is the qualified king. He's the qualified king. He is qualified to be king. Let's look, think back to Deuteronomy. It says the king must be chosen by God. Right? That was the very first requirement. The king must be chosen by God. It must be somebody that God appoints. Jesus was chosen by God to be our Savior. And there's a moment when Jesus is, you know, first beginning his ministry that he is baptized by John the Baptist. And when he's baptized, the Spirit des descends in the form of a dove. And the Father says, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. This is my Son whom I have appointed as Savior right? That Jesus is the fulfillment of all Old Testament prophecies. Any prophecy speaking of a future Messiah, future redemption, future forgiveness for the people of Israel is fulfilled in Jesus. He was the one who was chosen by God. He was set apart by God. And Jesus was God himself. He was the image of the invisible God sent into the world. And so Jesus is, first of all, the, the perfect king because he's set apart by God. And also we learn that the king must be from within the nation of Israel, right? The king must come from within the nation of Israel. And God makes a covenant with King David in the Old Testament. He says that there be a descendant from the line of David who would reign forever. Jesus is the fulfillment of this prophecy, right? And we can see the evidence of this if in the uh, genealogy of Jesus in Matthew and Luke, when you open it up, it's one of those passages, if you're like me, this is just confession time. But if you're like me, you sometimes open a Bible and you see the genealogy and you just flip the next page. You're like, yeah, there's a bunch of names in there I don't know, know how to pronounce <laughs> or don't, haven't heard those before. But the genealogy of Jesus is so important, it's included in Scripture because it verifies Jesus as the rightful king. It verifies that Jesus is the fulfillment of the promise, the covenant that God made with David. And so just a reminder for me and for all of us, any section of scripture that we're ever tempted to jump over or avoid, we probably shouldn't because everything in the word is in the word for a reason, and it's for our good. Okay, so Jesus is the qualified king, but Jesus is also the humble king. He's the humble king. See, the ideal king must not acquire many horses for himself and therefore trust in their own military might but they must trust in God alone. Jesus, while he was here on earth, had all authority, right? All authority. He could have called down armies of angels to come in any situation that he was in to protect him, to rescue him. He was in full control. But while he was here on earth, what did he do? He yielded himself to the Father, 
He submitted himself fully to the Father and to the Father's plan. He wasn't trusting in might and military strength, but he was trusting in the heart of God. He was trusting in the heart of his Father. And the king must not acquire many wives, right? We talked about this. They might, he must not form unhealthy alliances with other nations. I love this. Jesus did not come to this earth to use people from other nations to achieve a right political standing, but rather Jesus came so that we may have life and we may have life abundantly. He didn't come to take advantage of people. He didn't come to use people in any particular way, but he came so that he could set people free and that people could have life and have life forever. Amen? And the king must not acquire much silver and gold and therefore trust in his own riches. Jesus was born in a stable, right? Here here it is, right behind me. Born in a stable, in the humblest of beginnings. The most wild, most unforeseen entrance into the world by a king ever. Is that Jesus came in a stable. And Jesus, while he was here on earth, he placed no emphasis on earthly wealth or acquiring great amounts of money and power, but rather instead of that, he challenged those he interacted with to give up of their wealth for the good of other people. He said, don't try to acquire all this money for yourself, but rather give that money away. Give those resources away. Give your very self away to other people. And Jesus was never willing to do, or to ask us to do something that he wasn't willing to do himself. And if he was asking us to give up of ourselves to others, it's because he gave up of himself by coming into this world. That he came to set us free. And Jesus was a wanderer. He had no place to lay his head at night. He had no place to call home. He was unknown by the very people that he helped create. He was rejected by the people that he had set apart. Jesus was the furthest thing from rich while he was here on the earth. He was the furthest thing from it. But nevertheless, his gaze was always on the Father. He still had complete trust. His faith in God was not dependent on the amount of resources that he had. All right, finally, you still with me this morning, church? We still got a couple hours to go here. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, finally, Jesus is the righteous king. Jesus is the righteous king. We're told that the king was to be educated in the word of God. I love this. Jesus was the word of God. Jesus wasn't educated in the word. He was the word. John will tell us that Jesus was the word made flesh. He was the word of God. Nobody, nobody knew the word of God better than Jesus. Jesus was the living and active word of God. And Jesus followed the law perfectly while he was here on earth, right? Jesus was the ultimate fulfillment of every law, of every prophecy that was laid out in Scripture. He lived a sinless life, one without error or blemish, and he was the perfect sacrificial lamb. One without failure or regret, he was perfect. He was perfect. That's what makes him the worthy king. That's what makes him the fulfillment of what we read here in Deuteronomy 17. And that is what encourages my heart this holiday season because Jesus is the perfect king. He is worthy to be praised. He is worthy to be followed. And he is worthy for us to put our trust in. He's worthy of it. And through his life here on earth, Jesus proved that he was the perfect king. He was the long-anticipated Savior of Israel, the one who'd been foretold since the beginning. But I love this. Jesus is even a better king than Deuteronomy can explain, right? Deuteronomy has this expectation, hey, here's what's going to make a great king. And Jesus comes on the scene, and Jesus is so much better (laughs) than any expectation for what people would have for a king. Because Jesus is not just the king of the nation of Israel. Jesus is the king of anybody who would put their faith in him. Jesus is the king of a kingdom that is not of this world in a kingdom that will have no end. That one day is coming when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That his kingdom will reign forever. And he's a saving king. He's a king who is willing and able to draw us out of death, to 